Hello class, today's lecture is on chapter 10, which is the chapter on neurology, or the study of the nerves and the nervous system. Alright, the nervous system, let's come up, uh, oh, before I start talking about the nervous system, the word of the day, I actually have two terms of the day. Um, the first one is Alice in Wonderland Syndrome, which I, I think is funny, I like Disney movies. Um, and it's named after, well, it's named after the book, the, the story by Lewis Carroll, which was then made into a Disney movie. Um, but it's a name for a condition where um, you start to see things as being either abnormally large or abnormally small and sort of disproportionate, often associated with migraines or like hallucinogenic drugs. Also, brain injury can cause it. It's a sort of... Um, misperception of things. So it's called it's called Alice in Wonderland system syndrome after sort of the enlarging and, and shrinking that Alice goes through after she drinks the potion and eats the cake in that little room after she follows the white rabbit down the hole. Um, but I've sort of created a, a virtual example here on my computer through my little photo booth. So an example of micropsia of seeing things too small for instance seeing someone with a normal sized body and a teeny tiny head okay that would be an example of someone with um, Alice in Wonderland syndrome and it's usually temporary again after some kind of brain trauma or uh, taking some kind of hallucinogenic drug so a little trivia for you another one which I think is funny uh, um, condition of the nervous system is hyperexplexia, hyper hyperexplexia, uh, literally translates to a condition of excessive surprise. Hyper excessive eclexy is, I guess, means surprise. So um, there's a whole bunch of different, I guess, conditions that fall under types of hyperexplexia, but true hyperexplexia is apparently a genetic disorder. Uh, that affects um, a receptor that in nerve cells and causes you to have a sort of um, excessive response to startling. So I found this video on YouTube, which I'm not positive that this man has hyperexplexia, but it, it seems like the response that I would um, expect. So he, I guess he's a car salesman, and um, some of his workers took all these videos of him. Notice how he startles in a lot of these situations. Other people in the room are not startled by these noises, or um, but he has this very twitchy, you know, quick, <laughs> excessive response. So I imagine that is that would be true hyperexplexia, just a, a quick. You know, it's it's just a quick response. What you usually how you usually respond when someone really scares you, except the difference is that the things that people are doing are not really all that startling necessarily, or wouldn't startle a normal person. Anyway, and that's enough. <laughs> so, hyperexplexia. There you go. I'm a little more trivia for you. So the nervous system. The nervous system can be divided into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And uh, this slide kind of charts it out for you in, in a way that I like. So the nervous system, two parts, the CNS, central nervous system, and the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system com is composed of the brain and the spinal cord. Those are the that is the part of the of the nervous system that really is the master controller, the central you know station. 
All right, the peripheral nervous system is everything else, all the nerves that shoot off the spinal cord, so the spinal nerves, and also the nerves that come out of the cranium, the cranial nerves, which enter your face and some in your neck. So, uh, the, and they're the ones that basically control the rest of your body and report back to the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system can then be further subdivided into the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system, or in other words, the voluntary and involuntary um, nervous system. So the somatic nervous system is your voluntary nervous system. This, this allows you to have motor control over your skeletal muscles. So that's how I'm moving my hand right now. Uh, autonomic nervous system is the involuntary nervous system. Um, involuntary muscle contractions like um, in your stomach as you're digesting, um, your heart and lungs, breathing, etc. Um, and the autonomic nervous system can also be subdivided into two parts, the parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division, which um, one is active when you are at rest and the other is activated when you are stressed, under some kind of a stress. Um, so I'm actually going to talk about those a little bit more at the end of the lecture. We'll come back to them. So the central nervous system, remember, is composed of two parts, the brain and the spinal cord. So we'll start talking with the brain. The brain is the largest part of the nervous system, of the whole nervous system. And it is located within the cranium, within the skull. We haven't formally learned the, the names of the bones yet, but so here's your first one. The skull is the cranium, all right? The largest part, is, and then the brain, there's multiple parts of the brain. The largest part of the brain is the cerebrum, which is the folded part um, right here, okay? That contains all the lobes of the brain. Then there's also these other parts of the brain. Let's blow this up. All right, and we'll look at it here. So the cerebrum is this folded part uh, here, and it's divided into different lobes. And then you also have the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the brain stem, and all of the ventricles, these sort of, they're fluid-filled holes or cavities within the brain. And then also the last part is the cerebellum back here. Try not to get confused between the two names. Sometimes I slip up verbally, but this between the cerebrum, which is the big part here, and the cerebellum, which is like the little brain back here, okay? Cerebrum versus cerebellum. Uh, we'll put that back. So the, the whole um, brain is surrounded by meninges, which are membranes that keep the brain protected and sort of cushioned within the cranium so that there's no chafing and that it, you know, floats around all comfortably. So um, this is a picture from your textbook that sort of illustrates the different layers uh, around the brain. So here's the brain, here's the cerebral tissue, uh, and here's the cranium, the skull. This is bone, this outer layer here. And this one, two, three layers here are the layers of the meninges, the three meninges. You have the dura mater, which is the outer layer, which actually, I guess I'm going to talk about in more detail later. Um, the different layers of the of the meninges, um, the different layers of the cerebrum. There's the gray matter and the white matter of the cerebrum. The gray matter is the outer layer, and it is actually gray because and white. The differences in color are actually because of the arrangement of the neurons in the brain. So the neural cell body. Uh, is located in the gray matter, the outer layer of the cerebrum. And then the axons, the long tail of the neurons, um, which are covered in these fatty myelin sheaths, which fat is kind of like a whitish yellow color. So these, these fatty sheaths um, cause the sort of internal part of the cerebrum to be a white color. So you have the white matter and the gray matter. The gray matter of the cerebrum is referred to as the cerebral cortex. Um, so when we were talking about the cerebral cortex, we're talking about the gray matter. Um, so that is what I just 
sort of told you what was on this slide here. Uh, the one other thing that I didn't uh, mention is, or another, you know, sort of vocabulary word here, are the gyri and sulci of the brain. So again, when we're talking about the folds and grooves of the cerebrum, the folds, the little humps, the hills, are called gyri. Singular would be gyrus. And the grooves are called sulci, or a singular would be sulcus, or sulcus, sorry. Sulcus is singular, sulci is plural. All right. Uh, so those are the major parts of the cerebrum. Oh, one more thing about the cerebrum. The cerebrum is divided in half by this anterior to posterior fissure here. It's like a like a chasm, okay? Um, and it divides the brain into right and left sides or right and left hemispheres. Hemi meaning half and sphere meaning, you know, a whole circle thing. So, um, two hemispheres, right and left, left and right, <laughs> get my sides correct. Um, and there's a, a, a structure called the corpus callosum right here that actually connects the right and left hemispheres so that they can then communicate with each other and send uh, neural signals to one another. So um, the way that the uh, brainstem connects and the corpus callosum and the wiring is set in the brain. Actually, the right side of the brain communicates with the left side of the body, and the left side of the brain gets signals from the right side of the body, from the way that the, the signals cross over. So the corpus callosum then integrates all of these signals so that you can coordinate both sides of the body. It's kind of interesting. So the right hemisphere of the brain ha and the left hemisphere of the brain are sort of associated with some different qualities or different um, characteristics and abilities. The right hemisphere is often thought of as the creative side of the brain. Um, it recognizes patterns and facial recognition. Um, it's very spatial, so you can um, people who can visualize things in three dimensions um, have very good functioning of the right side of their brain. Um, it also is responsible, thought to be responsible for a lot of emotion, uh, understanding emotions and emotionality. Uh, whereas the left hemisphere is the more analytical side. Math and logic and reasoning skills come from that side. Uh, memory, recall, uh, etc. So the cerebrum is, like I mentioned, divided into different lobes. And those lobes are actually named after the bones of the cranium under which they sit. So the frontal bone, parietal bone, temporal bone, and occipital bones uh, overlay the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes of the cerebrum. We're going to talk very basically and briefly about the, some of the you know, major functions of each of those lobes. So the frontal lobe, frontal lobe is right here in the front, okay, in your forehead. Um, and that is where conscious thought takes place. So, and it's thought to be where intelligence comes from. Um, but, so, any, pretty much anything conscious comes from there. Planning, um, analyzing things, um, uh, speech, even formation of words comes from the frontal lobe. Voluntary conscious control over your body all originates in the frontal lobe. The parietal lobes, which are sort of on the top and sort of extend out to the sides a little bit, um, are where somatosensory information is integrated. So somatosensory, somato meaning body, senso, feeling, or touch. So any type of touch, when something touches your skin, you're, you're processing that in the parietal lobe. Also in the parietal lobe is the sense of taste, the gustatory cortex. Gustatory having the function of taste. Gusto or gustato means taste. Uh, the temporal lobe to the side here, the lateral side of the cerebrum, there's two of them, temporal lobes, Okay, one on either side. And they are near, sort of behind your ear and your nose, I guess, so it makes sense that the auditory cortex for hearing and the olfactory cortex 
or smell, are located there. And finally, you have the occipital lobe, which is in the posterior side, the most posterior lobe, and it is the home of the visual cortex for vision. So all five senses have been accounted for now. Okay. Um, so the next couple of slides sort of have the notes that I'm going to tell you now. I'm not really going to spend time on those slides, but if you want to flip through in your notes as I'm talking so you know what to write down and what not to write down, that's cool. So we've talked about the cerebrum and the sulci and gyri, the folds and the grooves, um, as the largest part of the brain, but the other parts of the brain here, the thalamus, hypothalamus, brainstem, cerebellum, ventricles, that's what we're going to discuss now, okay? So the first part here, the thalamus, this little portion right here, right in the middle, kind of, of the brain, is its central location um, sort of determines its function, which is as sort of a central uh, coordinator of signals coming into and out of the brain. It's like a relay station, okay? Um, so it collects information that is coming in and, and um, sort of helps to act as this relay station between the brainstem and the cerebrum. Also, it plays a role in sensing emotions, part of the limbic system, the emotion system. The next part of the brain is right under the thalamus, therefore it is called the hypothalamus, meaning below the thalamus. And it is part of the endocrine system as well as the nervous system because the endocrine system is the part of the body that secretes hormones and the hypothalamus actually produces hormones. The hypothalamus is a key regulator of a lot of our sort of most vital bodily functions, eating, drinking, sleeping, and sex. So those are all really strongly regulated by the hypothalamus. Excuse me. Um, the ventricles, there's four of them. You can only see, I think, two in this slide. The lateral ventricle, and then the fourth ventricle is here, and then there's two more ventricles back in here. Um, and they are like fluid-filled chambers in the brain. They actually are full of um, cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, which is fluid that lubricates the brain tissue, but also is um, where the brain essentially gets its glucose from. So the brain's sort of floating around in the cerebrospinal fluid, and also it contains that cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles. The CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is produced by special cells that line these ventricles that are called ependymal cells. Ependymal cells. All right, it's on the slide here. Ependymal. And the cerebrospinal fluid, like I said, contains glucose and other proteins and things. Um, and it's just a fluid that helps cushion the brain to protect it. Now we are down onto the brain stem here. Um, the brain stem consists of three parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, okay? So the midbrain is, its sort of key functions are in reflexes. A lot of your reflex reactions are controlled by the midbrain here. The pons also sort of acts as a relay station kind of like the thalamus does within the midbrain. So the pon or sorry, within the brain stem. So the pons helps to collect impulses from the spinal cord and send them probably to the thalamus, which then sends them to the cerebrum. The medulla oblongata, for those of you who are fans of Adam Sandler and what the water boy, I do not think is the reason why alligators are ornery. Um, but I'm not an expert in that area. Apparently, the medulla oblongata does help set the respiratory rate and the heart rate, which go up when you're angry or ornery, so I don't know. There's a relation there, but um, it, its primary role is to help set your heart rate and your breathing rate. Um, so that is pretty much... Oh, and then 
that's the that's the brain stem. So I'm gonna jump ahead to where I am in the slides. Sorry. The last part of the brain, all right, we're still on the brain, remember the largest part of the nervous system, is here, the cerebellum, all right? And the cerebellum's sort of claim to fame is that it has a major role in controlling balance, your sense of balance. Also, parts in your inner ear do that, but um, balance and coordination are largely uh, mediated by the cerebellum, this little sort of mini brain in the back underneath posterior and inferior to the cerebrum. This is the front side, this is the or the anterior side and the posterior side that we're looking at here in this section. All right. So, remember I mentioned earlier that there are three membranes, the meninges that surround the um, the the brain. All right, we taught, we showed this slide before. So you have the bone, the cranium, and then you have these three layers. So you have the dura mater, the arachnoid layer, and then the pia mater here is the most, um, I guess, visceral layer, okay? Whereas the dura mater would be the parietal layer. It is close to the outside, the wall of the cavity, the cranial cavity. So the dura, dura mater, dura, actually means hard or tough, and um, mater stands for mother, like your alma mater, where you went to school. Um, so the dura mater is the tough, fibrous, sort of thicker layer, whereas the pia mater inside here is a thin, more um, delicate layer of the meninges. The middle layer, the arachnoid layer, has these um, sort of uh, extensions, these fibrous extensions that look kind of like a spider web, hence the name arachnoid. Arach arachno means spider, arachnids, spiders, arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Okay, so the arachnoid layer has this sort of spider webby look, um, which gives it its name. And it is also filled the with fluid, you can kind of see that here, filled with cerebrospinal fluid, again, made by those ependymal cells that helps protect the brain, keep it nice and lubricated and cushioned, and also nourished. So that is the layers of the meninges. On to the next part of the spinal, of the uh, central nervous system, the spinal cord, all right? Um, which is a long column of spinal tissue, or of nervous tissue, that goes through the spinal cavity, down um, through the vertebrae, actually. And the end of the spinal cord ends in a bundle of nerves that kind of looks like a ponytail or a horse's tail, so it actually has the name cauda equina, which literally means horse's tail, equine, horse, cauda, if you remember from caudal direction, tail towards the tail. Cauda is tail, equina horse. Um, and also the spinal cord also has layers of meninges that surround it, these protective membranes, and that are very similar to the meninges that surround the brain, except there's this one extra layer, which is called the epidural space, which is where epidural um, anesthesia is administered into that epidural space, which I'll show you where that is just now. So here is a, a view of um, a vertebra, a vertebra, um, a bone, one of the spinal bones. And you can see here is the spinal cord. And just like the brain, um, the, just like the cerebrum, <laughs> there's gray matter and white matter, but they're sort of flip flop. So in this case, the white matter is on the outside, the gray matter is on the inside because of the arrangement of the neurons is different. The neuron cell bodies are internal, whereas the axons, the myelin sheathed axons, are um, more superficial in the spinal cord. So, the spinal, so all of the um, vertebra have this hole called a foramen, which we'll talk about again in the next upcoming chapters. Um, that the spinal cord passes through. So the spinal cord passes through this hole. It's surrounded by meninges, which are full of cerebrospinal fluid, which is that blue stuff in, in there. 
And then you have this epidural space, which is actually filled with some, like, sort of fatty fluid, okay? And that protects, just further protects the spinal cord from chafing against the um, bone, okay? So that is the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. Now we are on to the peripheral nervous system, the PNS, starting with the cranial nerves, the nerves that extend from the cranium. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves, um, six on the right, six on the left, and their names often reflect their location and or their function. Um, and they can have different functions. They can either uh, sense, have sensory function, so like to sense taste or something, to, uh, sense taste or, or smell, um, or they can send motor commands, like to move the tongue or to move, you know, the cheek muscle or something. And some of them do both. They have multiple functions. They can have sensory functions, and they can also have motor functions. So um, for this class, I don't expect you to memorize all 12 pairs of cranial nerves, but if I said, where is the olfactory nerve located, and it was a multiple choice question, I would expect you to be able to identify that it is a cranial nerve. Um, based on its name, the fact that it's involved in the sense of smell, that it would be in part of the head of the cranial um, system. So things like that, just to use a little bit of common sense and medical you know, terminology knowledge to be able to. Or if I said, what is the function of the olfactory nerve, you should be able to tell me it is the sense of smell, knowing that the word parts mean having the function of the sense of smell. All right? In your anatomy physiology class, you will probably have to memorize all of them and possibly know where they're located. All right, for this class, I mostly just want you to understand, based on the medical terminology, what the function of the nerves are. All right, the optic nerve involved in the eyes, eye vision, opto. Um, oculomotor nerve, what is the function of that nerve? It is to move the eye, motor, move, and oculo, um, eye, so things like that. All right, very... Um, terminology-based knowledge. The trochlear nerve, I thought this one's kind of neat. Trochleo means a structure shaped like a pulley. It's actually involved in moving the eye and it works kind of like a pulley. Uh, the trigeminal nerve is, there are three, there's a group of three of them, and it has three different branches. And these nerves actually, if they get, um, they can I so I had random story tangential story. I had one of my tooth nerves die, and um, it was extremely extremely painful. And I had this headache that shot from it like all the way up my head that felt almost like a sinus headache. And I you know of course get on to Google and like you know facial pain. What could this be? And so some things that it was sinus pain. Others said it could be the tooth nerve, and others said that it could be this trigeminal nerve, that um, one of the branches is, uh, there's maxillary and mandibular um, branches, so it causes this very similar pain to this tooth nerve pain. And I just thought that's what it was. I thought it was a really bad headache and didn't realize till like a year later that actually it was the, it was the nerve that had died, and then I had to have a root canal, and oh. Don't like dental work. But anyway, trigeminal nerve, three branches in the in the face. Um, and can be very, very painful, cause a lot of pain. Um, the abducens nerve, won't really get into that one. Facial nerve, so there's, you know, there's a few of them here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but things that, so here, here's one, actually. The vestibulocochlear nerve. Cochlea is a part of the ear, the inner part of the ear, all right, and it's involved in sensing auditory um, sensations, so hearing, it's involved in hearing. Uh, the glossopharyngeal nerve, it, glosso meaning tongue, 
pharyngeo meaning throat, all right? So this is pertaining to the throat and tongue. So the glossopharyngeal nerve actually has, it has sensory functions in the form of taste and olfaction, or sorry, gustation, that would be the sense of taste, but it also has motory function in the movement of the tongue and the throat, I guess. The vagus nerve, I like the name of this nerve, vagus or vagal actually uh, means wandering. The, the word part vago, combining form vago means wandering because this is the only cranial nerve that actually wanders out of the head space and into the neck and into the chest a little bit. It goes to the heart muscle and is involved in um, movement of the esophagus, stomach, intestines, etc., so it wanders out of the head, so it gets the name of vagus nerve. So those are the cranial nerves, the 12 sets. Sorry, I was wrong. There's 12 pairs. I said before, six on one side, six on the other. I meant 12 on one side, 12 on the other. There's 12 pairs. All right, the spinal nerve, there are 31 pairs, all right? Basically, these are the nerves that, as you go down the spinal cord, they radiate out of the spinal cord um, and extend into the periphery of the body, to, into your limbs, into your in intestines, into your legs and toes, etc. Each of these pairs of nerves that radiate off the spinal cord um, have two different roots that connect to the spinal cord. So they go out and come back in. The dorsal nerve root, so on the back side, here, see here, right? The dorsal nerve root on the posterior side of the spinal cord um, receives information. Okay, so that is receiving sensory information. Anything, if I you know scratch my hand, that sensation, that somatosensory sensation, is being received by the dorsal nerve root of whichever spinal nerve is in my hand. All right. The ventral nerve root is the one that sends out motor information or motor commands. So when I move my fingers, that is um, coming from a spinal nerve. Well, it's coming originally from probably the frontal lobe of my brain that then gets, that signal gets transmitted down to the spinal nerve that is controlling or sends motor information to the hand coming out of the ventral side of that of that nerve. So then you can see how these these roots, the dorsal root and the nerve root both connect to the same nerve fiber here, nervous fiber. Um, so the spinal nerves control also control reflexes um, which are you know, rapid responses to some kind of a stimulus, either to pain, like if you touch a hot stove. I remember one time when I was younger, I think every kid probably does this at some point, my mom baked chocolate chip cookies, and she pulls them out of the oven, and she sticks the pan on the stove to cool off, and she says, don't touch those, they're hot. But, of course, when she turns her back, I reach up to grab a cookie because they just looked and smelled so good, and, of course, I burned my hand I think I actually burned my hand on the pan. I think I accidentally touched the pan in the process of reaching for the cookies and burned myself. But of course, you know, as soon as I felt the heat, I pulled away instinctively. It was a reflex to pain. Um, and that is something that's controlled by spinal nerves that probably sensing that, you know, the heat. Um, so those are the spinal nerves um, in short. Now a little bit about the nerve cells themselves, which maybe is where the chapter should have started. But for some reason, this textbook always does the you know, sort of anatomy of the basic cell types at the end of the chapter. So um, there's two different types of nerves. Well, there's multiple types of nerve cells, but they can be divided into neurons and neuroglia. So neurons are the actual nerve cells that send motor signals and, and send sensory information and send transmit signals along the nervous tissue. Um, neuroglia are separate, are, are sort of nerve-like cells. They're cells that are within the nervous tissue, but they're not neurons. They don't have axons and send nerve um, signals. They are helper cells. So glia 
literally means, is a, is a suffix that means cells that provide support. They are support cells. Ependymal cells, for example, are some that we've already talked about, that their purpose is to line the ventricles and the cavities of the, of the um, central nervous system and, pr and uh, produce cerebrospinal fluid. So they, their job as support cells is to produce the cerebrospinal fluid that then coats and protects neurons in the nervous tissue. So, but the neurons are really the parenchyma of the nervous system. They are the functional tissue, the functional units. Um, and nerves are bundles of neurons that work together. All right. So just to talk about a few more different, so there's multiple types of neuroglia of these support cells. Ependymal cells, one that I mentioned that produce cerebrospinal fluid. There's astrocytes. Astrocytes have a star-like shape, so they are um, unlike the neuro neurons, which we'll talk about, that have this, they're sort of, I guess, star shape, but then have this long tail, this long axon. Astrocytes are just this very star-shaped type of a cell. Astro, meaning star, like an asteroid, like a shooting star, okay? They're star resembling a star. Asteroid means resembling a star. Um, asterisk, little star um, icon, okay? Uh, microglia, very small glial cells. They um, are actually kind of like the macrophages within the brain tissue. They um, phagocytize dead nervous tissue, help keep it clean, help keep the brain tissue clean. Oligodendroglia, one of your, oh, if you, if you had a spelling list, this was one of the spelling words and pronunciation words that people struggle with a lot. Oligodendroglia is how you pronounce it. Oligo means few or scanty. Um, I think we've seen that prefix before. And Schwann cells, another one was going to be another spelling word. Schwann is an eponym named after the, I think, I can't remember, Norwegian or something, um, or Polish person, anatomist who first described them. They produce, the Schwann cells are important for producing that myelin sheath that coats, that fatty sheath that coats the axon. So I keep talking about the ner cell body and the axon of the nerve, and we really haven't even discussed that yet. This is the anatomy of a neuron. So a neuron looks like this. There's the cell body here, and coming off the cell body are all these little branches um, that are called dendrites. Uh, dendro means branching or branch. So these dendrites come off the cell body and they um, connect to the synapses of other uh, neurons, um, as you can see down here. So the, the cell body, there's a long extension of the cell body called the axon, this long sort of tail that comes off the cell body. And this is where um, nervous signal signal transmission takes place so some other cell I guess really it's better demonstrated down here so this neuron will send some chemical signal down the axon and the axon ends here at the synapses where it joins with other dendrites where it sort of connects to dendrites of other neurons and then so this so this chain reaction of nerve transmission can take place and you have a, a close-up here of a synapse where there's neurotransmitters that are being released from the axon of one cell and picked up by the dendrite of another cell. And then that nerve signal then transmits down the axon of the next cell and so on and so forth for this chain reaction. And you can see here the myelin sheaths, these little fatty coatings or coverings. They remind me of those things that you put on your pencil to protect, you know, little pencil cushions to protect your finger from getting calloused or to make it thicker so you can hold it. Um, like little rubber coatings. Okay, so in this case, they're a little fatty coating around the axon to protect it and keep it safe because it's this long, thin, slender tubule that could, you know, get damaged. Um, so, and again, those myelin sheaths are produced by 
the Schwann cells. That's how you pronounce it, Schwann. Maybe it's German. I can't remember. Um, so these are just the slides sort of telling you the, what I just said in note form about the axons. And then the last part of the chapter goes through the different um, neurotransmitters. There's a lot of different chemicals, little um, particles, chemicals that are act as messengers, chemical messengers between nerve cells, and they're called neurotransmitters. And again, in this course, I'm not going to require you to know all of the functions and the different types of neurotransmitters, but in your AMP and possibly human biology classes, you will need to know them. Um, so I'm just going to kind of skip over that table. And then the last thing I said I was going to come back to that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture was the somatic nervous system, or sorry, the, really that I was going to come back to was the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. So I already kind of mentioned the somatic nervous system is the one you have voluntary control over. Autonomic nervous system is the one that is involuntary. And that autonomic nervous system is divided into both the parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division. So the parasympathetic division is active when you are at rest, when you are relaxed, when you're sleeping. All right, It's often referred to as the rest and digest system or rest and digest activities. So right now, presumably, you're laying back in a comfy chair, watching this lecture on your computer, maybe even snacking a little bit, okay? Your parasympathetic nervous system is what is active right now. When you're studying for a test and you're really anxious and you're stressed out, that's when the sympathetic division nervous system kicks into gear. Uh, originally, I think the sympathetic division um, was designed to deal with with sudden stress, like, you know, you're a zebra being hunted by a lion in the Serengeti, okay, so you're really stressed, you gotta either make a quick decision whether you're gonna fight the lion and try to save your life that way, or run like hell to get away from it, okay, so it's the typical fight or flight response, the stress response, um, when you're f suffering from fear or anxiety, whether it be um, sudden, like in the case of the zebra, or chronic even in the case of really humans are the only animals that really suffer from chronic stress, but it's also active when you are exercising, so when your heart rate goes up. Um, so this brings us to the second half of the chapter. That's all of the basic anatomy and physiology of the brain. The second half of the chapter deals with diseases and conditions of the brain. Um, amnesia literally means A. A is without or loss of. And mnesio uh, would be the combining form for memory. So um, M-N-E. Also, the beginning of the word mnemonic, that's how you spell the word mnemonic. So things, memory aids, something that helps you uh, remember something. So amnesia is a condition of the loss of memory, which is different than, uh, I can't remember. I was going to compare it to another term that I can't remember. Anyway, amnesia, loss of memory. Um... Anencephaly is a condition, literally means condition without the brain, encephalo, within the head. Encephalo means within the head, so the brain is within the head. Encephalo means brain. It's a condi congenital condition um, that you're born, it means you're born with it, um, often from not getting enough nutrients, particularly folic acid, during pregnancy can result in this condition of anencephaly, a child that is born without a brain, and they usually are born, stillborn, or die within, you know, 48 hours or so of birth, because literally chunks of their brain are missing. Aphasia, a condition without speech. Phasia means speech, therefore dysphasia is a condition of abnormal speech, difficulty speaking or understanding speak, which is not to be confused with dysphagia. Dysphagia versus dysphagia. There are sort of subtle pronunciation differences there, but the spelling should give it away. One is 
difficulty speaking, the other is difficulty eating. Okay? Um, some other conditions of the brain. Um, an arteriovenous malformation is where there is poor formation, bad formation of arteries and veins, or veins, okay, in the brain. And it can cause um, those malformations or those AVMs can rupture and cause a stroke. The medical term for stroke is CVA, a cerebrovascular accident, because that's essentially what a stroke is. It's when there's some kind of vascular accident, va vascular rupture within the cerebrum, within the brain, um, that causes tissue death, because then blood is spewing everywhere. It can cause swelling in the brain. It can also cause blood not to get to the brain. Also can be caused by, so that's what this second one here, the rupture of some um, artery or vein. It can also be caused by a blood clot blocking blood flow to an area of the brain. A blood clot or a thrombus, okay, when it gets, a thrombus gets, is a blood clot, when it gets stuck in a small capillary or artery, it's called an embolism. And that can block blood flow and cause tissue death. So, again, cause of a stroke. So, some of the consequences of stroke, well, it can cause death is one consequence, but if you recover from a stroke and have some sustained brain damage, it can cause partial paralysis or weakness um, in part of the body. So remember, the brain is divided into left and right hemispheres, and if you have a stroke on one side of the brain, it can cause weakness or paralysis in the other side of the brain. And we call this weakness hemiparesis. So weakness on half of the body, that's what this woman is displaying here. Or maybe she's displaying hemiplegia. It's more like it. So one side of the body is this side here. Her right side of her body is very slack. And um, you can see it. her mouth is sort of slack. It looks like her arm, she can't move this arm here. Um, it's paralyzed. So again, a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke on the left side of the brain will cause right side hemiplegia paralysis. Plegia is the combining form for plegio, combining form for paralysis. So we'll talk about in a minute a paraplegic or a quadriplegic. Um, there's also different types of brain tumors. And again, the, the suffix that means tumor or mass is oma. So and depending on the type of brain cell that is um, growing excessively. You can have an astrocytoma of the astrocytes, ependymoma, ependymoma, yeah, of the ependymal cells, etc. Some of these are malignant, some of them are benign, some of them can be benign or malignant, meaning that some are non-cancerous and just hopefully potentially can be removed and then um, asymptomatic again. Some are malignant, meaning that they're cancerous and can continue to grow excessively and be fatal. Um, here's a angiograph of, or sorry, a radiograph of a brain tumor. I don't know which, oh, it's a glioma, apparently. A large one. Um, some other diseases and conditions in the brain, coma is a state of unconsciousness, a prolonged and deep state of unconsciousness. A concussion is any kind of trauma to the brain, it's basically bruising of the brain, and can cause a subdural hematoma, which is very dangerous. It's under the dura, so under the mani within the brain, um, a blood mass, so blood so bleeding, basically it means bleeding within the brain, subdural hematoma. And in fact, um, the, basically, if you get hit in the head really hard and you get a concussion that causes subdural hematoma, you, it's, it can be fatal. Um, my husband actually had a friend who died a few years ago from a subdural hematoma after falling. Trip, he was walking on an icy sidewalk and he tripped and hit his head really hard and ended up with a subdural hematoma caused brain swelling and he died. And also, 
Um, Gabby Giffords, the congresswoman who got shot in the head, she had subdural hematoma from that. And what they actually did is they actually gave her a craniotomy. They opened up her cranium to re allow the brain to swell. And then when it was done swelling, they closed it back up. So that's how she survived, really. Uh, syncope is the medical term for fainting. If you pass out, you have um, experienced syncope. Cephalalgia, I like this, is the medical term for headache. If this wasn't in the book, I would have made it my word of the day. Because headache is such a layman's term, you don't even think about the fact that there's actually a medical term for that. Cephalalgia. Aljo meaning condition of pain. Um, cephalo, head. And then a migraine is really like a specific type and a very extreme type of cephalalgia. Dyslexia is a condition, ia meaning condition, lexo, lexicon, reading or writing, and dis meaning condition or meaning difficulty. So it's a condition of difficulty either reading or writing words. And this girl here has dyslexia, and you can see, I forget which word she misspells in here, but she mixes up her letters. Um, Down syndrome is actually a genetic, congenital genetic disorder, um, where you have, so most, normally people have two sets of, of 23 chromosomes, so for a total of 46 chromosomes, each one name numbered 1 through 23. So if you have three sets instead of a pair, instead of two sets of chromosome 21, you have three of them, um, you have tr uh, Down syndrome. So it's also called trisomy 21, meaning you have three chromosome number 21. And it's na this is actually an eponym named after a man with the last name Down, Down syndrome. Um, <clears throat> dementia, that was the one I was thinking of instead of amnesia. There's a difference. Um, amnesia is a condition without memory. Dementia is the condition without the mind. Mento, meaning mind. Alzheimer's is a form of dementia, um, which is got to be mainly hereditary. Huntington's chorea, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are all eponyms named after people, right? Um, and they're all degenerative, degenerative diseases of the brain and of the mind. Um, Huntington's quarry, so Alzheimer's mostly affects memory, whereas Huntington's and Parkinson's affect uh, motor nerves and movement. And, um, well, I guess Huntington's does both. So it can result in dementia and spasms. Parkinson's results in, in spas, spastic movement as the motor nerves start to degenerate. Some other, another degenerative disease is ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, the acronym ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Practice that one pronunciation. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So it causes a hardening of the nerves of the muscle, um, my, amyotrophic. Um, so it's progressive degeneration of motor nerves, and it can progress slowly or quickly. It's different in different people who have ALS. Um, it can be a very sad disease, kind of comes on suddenly, and if it's very quick, um, I have a friend who has her aunt, my, one of my best friends from college, her aunt, who's like her super cool aunt, um, who she would come and visit us in college, and she was like lots of fun. She recently was diagnosed with ALS, and it was very quick progression. And unfortunately, one of the, type, one of the motor nerves or some of the motor nerves that have degenerated very quickly were her nerves that are involved in speech. So she can't speak very clearly. And it's very, I think, very sad because she can't communicate now. And she's this very vivacious and funny woman. And, and because of the disease, it's really changed her, you know, as a person. Some other people, you know, the, some of the nerves that are affected first are in their legs. 
it affects their ability to walk or their ability to control other parts of their body. So it's different for every patient, I think. Multiple sclerosis is considered an autoimmune disease that is a degenerative disease. It causes degeneration of the myelin sheaths that protect those um, uh, axons in the nerves, in your neurons. And um, so you start losing uh, motor coordination as well due to ge degeneration of the nerves because of your body attacking those myelin sheaths. Epilepsy is another disease of the nervous system, causes um, seizures or spasms. I'm giving this lecture right now on the computer in the middle of August, and it's freaking sweltering in my office, so I don't know if you can see the sweat dripping, but I'm feeling it. Maybe that was too, too much information, but there you go. Um, epilepsy convulsions or seizures, those are synonyms, um, and there's several combining forms that pertain to the word seizure. Epilepto means seizure, also icto means seizure, so they say that um, after a seizure, they refer to that time as post-ictal, after, pertaining to after a seizure, post-ictal. Um, there's different types of ep epilepsy, different types of seizures. You can have grand mal seizures, also referred to as tonic-clonic. Those are the ones that you, I think, stereotypically think of when you think of seizures, someone having these, like, really, you know, sp spasms and shaking and convulsing, okay? Um, that would be a grand mal seizure. Uh, some people have, who have epilepsy have um, absence seizures or petite mal seizures. And these are, um, it kind of, if you've ever seen someone who experiences this type of seizure, it almost looks like maybe their eyes roll back in their head a little bit. They just look like, they kind of look like they just went blank. And, you know, for maybe a minute or so, they just kind of like are staring into space. There's not a lot of jerking. They're just kind of not there. And then they come back and didn't know what happened. I had a friend, um, actually the same friend from college whose aunt has ALS. She also has a cousin whose partner has um, these petite mal seizures. And it, the first time, the only time I've ever seen one was uh, we were eating lunch together. And this hat, we were having a conversation. And all of a sudden, he just stopped talking kind of went blank and I was like what's going on and then his boyfriend you know was like oh no it's fine he's you know just having a seizure and he was totally calm about it I was like freaking out because I never I didn't know whether I should be scared or not but um he was fine narcolepsy is another type of disorder where FC that that um uh like epilepsy okay that seizure part word part is there and it and narco means sleep so narcolepsy a seizure of sleep people who um fall asleep sort of uncontrolled they're they're seized by sleep another i guess i'm always referencing like fictional movies and stories that i like but i went through a phase where i really loved the movie moulin rouge and one of the characters in that movie has narcolepsy, and he'll be like in the middle of a, singing a song, and he just passes out and falls asleep. I don't think that in real life the syndrome is that extreme, uh, but people who have a very hard time staying awake. <clears throat> um, this slide, I have sort of grouped together all of the itises of the nervous system, any type of inflammation or infection of a portion of the nervous system, whether it be the meninges or the brain itself or some type of, or some nerve, whether it be a peripheral nerve, usually peripheral nerves. Um, meningitis, encephalitis, neuritis. Most of these are caused by infection, some kind of bacterial infection that then results in inflammation of that part of the nervous system um, or viral infection. Some congenital diseases that uh, we talked about, actually anencephaly should have been thrown on this slide and possibly Down syndrome as well. Um, 
Anencephaly is a form of neural tube defect. Another type of neural tube defect is meningocele. This is a picture of a baby with meningocele. The meninges of the spinal cord and the spinal cord itself are actually herniated um, outside of the spinal cord or of the of the vertebral cord and of the body really. Um, these can often be surgically remedied and sort of inserted back into the vertebral space but often not without some kind of damage or injury to the spinal cord that often results in partial paralysis or or motor you know um, issues in the lower half of the body. Um, hydrocephalus literally means water in the head, water head, cephalus is head. Um, it's a buildup of cerebrospinal fluid in the head of infants that often has to be drained or relieved can cause brain damage otherwise because there's too much pressure on the brain. Cerebral palsy is caused by lack of oxygen to the newborn as during the labor process during birth and can result in nerve damage and brain damage. Radiculopathy is how you pronounce this word, radiculopathy. Radiculo refers to the nerve root. Also, rhizo is a, is a combining form that pertains to the nerve root at the end of the spinal cord, okay? Um, and it is any type of, I guess, disease or condition that affects the nerve root. One type of radiculopathy is a slipped disc. This is when you have sort of the, between the vertebra, there are these discs of tissue that help prevent chafing and stuff and prevent, um, I, I guess, make the spinal cord kind of flexible. If that disc ruptures, it can press on the nerve roots, press on the spinal nerve roots, and often causes pain in the, that shoots down your leg. Um, the sciatic nerve is the nerve that runs down your leg, which is where um, that slip disc can be pressing on. Remember when we talked about stroke, I talked about plegia, the combining form plegio meaning paralysis. Hemiplegia is um, paralysis of half of the body, a right or left half of the body um, after a stroke. Paraplegia or quadriplegia are paralysis after spinal cord injury. So depending on where along the spinal cord the trauma occurs, it determines how much um, paralysis uh, there is. So paralysis basically occurs inferior to or south of the trauma site of the spinal injury. So if you have a spinal injury somewhere in the middle of the spine or the lumbar region, then you get paraplegia, meaning that para, meaning one of the, the meanings of the word part para <clears throat> is two or parts of a pair. So paraplegia is just in your legs, one, you know, one pair of limbs. Quadriplegia affects all four limbs, your arms and your legs. So that is if the trauma occurs more superiorly in the cervical spinal cord area. Um, another friend of mine from college, his father, a couple years after we graduated from college, he called me to tell me that his he's in tears because his father had been cycling and some for some reason that's still unclear to this day ran into a car like just biked into a parked car and fell against the curb and and ended up damn I don't know I don't know if he hit the car with his head and that's where he got the injury, but he essentially broke his neck and had spinal cord injury in his cervical vertebrae and was paralyzed from the neck down. I think he has um, movement in his shoulder, so he can move his arms, but he can't move his hands. Um, so, sad story, but actually very inspirational story. He's um, really come back and really has a very positive attitude and 
has an elevator in the house and a voice-activated wheelchair and voice-activated computer and all this stuff. But that's tangential. Anyway, but he would be considered quadriplegic. Quadriplegic now. Um, neuropathy is, anytime you have a pathy, a pathy, it, we're talking about general general disease of that type of tissue. So a neuropathy is a general disease of the nerves. Neuralgia would be nerve pain. Any type of nerve pain would be a neuralgia. Anesthesia, a condition without feeling. So anesthesia can be administered medically, um, or it could be if you... Um, lose sensation from nerve from a neuropathy um, a colleague of mine cut her hand on a piece of glass one day um, and actually cut the nerve in her wrist and had to have a hand surgery but I think until it healed did experience some anesthesia in her fingers um, due to the neuropathy uh, hyperesthesia is a condition of above normal feeling, so above normal sensation. Um, paresthesia, which I think is a, a strange word, but para, like paranormal, I guess, um, is when you have sort of abnormal tingling sensation. So like when your foot falls asleep and you get that pricking or tingling sensation, that would be paresthesia. And that when your foot falls asleep, that's a sort of temporary paresthesia. But some people who have different neurological disorders have sen experienced paresthesia um, more chronically, and it's very can be very painful and uncomfortable. Synesthesia is a weird one. Another one that I would have done for a word of the day if it wasn't in the book. It's where you get your your. Um, <clears throat> sensation, different senses sort of confuse. So like you can hear colors or you can taste sound. Like the sound of a bell tastes like macaroni and cheese or something. I don't know. Um, it's hard to fathom. It's kind of strange. Miswiring in the brain, I guess. And the last sort of part of the chapter goes through some of the different procedures, radiologic or medical procedures that pertain to the nervous system. So if you are having, think you're having a stroke or um, an aneurysm, they can do a cerebral angiography where they introduce some kind of a dye and take an a x-ray um, of your head to see if there are any there's an aneurysm, a weakness, a weak spot that might be rupturing. <clears throat> um, you can do a CAT scan, a CT scan, MRI, or positron, positron emission tomography, a PET scan. Um, these are all different imaging techniques, <clears throat> um, some that use radiographic dyes and some that don't. Um, a lumbar puncture is another type of medical procedure where you puncture into the lumbar region. So if you're getting an epidural, for example, um, it will, this is, a, you will require a lumbar puncture where they go into the lumbar portion of the spine and just into the epidural space for epidural anesthesia. Also, um, a lumbar puncture can be used to withdraw cerebrospinal fluid from the spine to test it for things like uh, intracranial bleeding or I don't know other diagnostic tests that they have to do. <clears throat> a biopsy again this is a term that you see in a lot of different uh, body systems if there's some kind of growth or disease or a tumor um, you would take out a living piece of tissue to look at it under a microscope. That's a biopsy. Craniotomy, I, I mentioned before, when I talked about subdural hematoma or swelling in the brain, having to do a craniotomy to open up the brain and or to open up the cranium and allow the brain to actually swell a little bit 
without it, the danger with brain swelling is that there's a hard encasement, the cranium, and there's no place for the brain to go. So if it gets too swollen, it gets suffocated by the, crania, the cranium. So craniotomy sort of allows the brain to swell, um, and then you can close it back up again. A ventriculoperitoneal shunt. This is done to, if you have surgery on the brain or if you have swelling in the brain, that it can drain that extra swelling fluid out into the peritoneum, the peritoneal cavity, and so that it can then be sort of flushed from the brain. I had a friend, my high school sweetheart actually, in ninth grade, had a brain tumor removed, and he had one of these shunts put in. Um, that then a couple years later started, I guess, shifted, maybe because he was growing, um, <clears throat> and started giving him horrible, horrible migraines. And I think they just ended up removing the shunt because it wasn't needed anymore because he didn't have this extra fluid buildup. Um, but anyway, that's what it, I never really understood what it was until I was teaching this class that, oh, that's what, that's what he was talking about, his shunt. Um, it's a, literally a tube that drains fluid from the brain down into the peritoneal cavity. Some drug categories that are pertinent to the nervous system. Analgesics. An analgesic can be, you can have over-the-counter analgesics like uh, Tylenol, Advil, aspirin, etc. Any kind of medicine that takes away pain, in, away, or without, algia, pain. Um, narcotics are also a type of analgesic that are not over the counter. Narco, meaning sleep, like narcolepsy. All, they also bring on, um, they ha often have analgesic anti-pain effects. They also often make you tired or sleepy. An anti-epileptic or an anti-convulsant would be a drug for people who have seizures. It's all in the name. And that is the end of this lecture. I'm not going to go through the um, little Quizlet questions, but I do invite you to go to MTI, go to the ER and MTI and quiz yourself there and through your homework problems. So the end.